subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome to Page Turner. Today we have Mr. Christoph Schaffelo, author of Modi's India, Hindu Nationalism and the Rise of Ethnic Democracy. Thank you so much for taking time out for us, Christoph. My question is that at what stage of the political pyramid are we at that we need to read a work like Modi's India, especially now that it's been eight years since he has been in term and practically there is a Congress Mukh Bharat and he sits as the emperor of so many hearts. What is the need that we need to go forward and read Modi's India? Well, I hope this book um, helps to figure out precisely where is the trajectory of Indian politics uh, taking, taking the country. And uh, the subtitle, as you said, is Hindu nationalism and the rise of ethnic democracy. And I think that the book is particularly useful figuring out to figure out what kind of democracy uh, is now prevailing uh, in the Indian context. And the idea of ethnic democracy comes from elsewhere. It's a mm -hmm. concept that has been uh, applied to Israel in the first place, a country where you have uh, elections, a rather independent judiciary, rather pluralist media, mm -hmm. but a country where some citizens are second class citizens. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a de jure ethnic democracy because Israel is a Jewish state, but you can have a de facto ethnic mm -hmm. democracy where uh, minorities are second class citizens in spite of the law, in spite of the constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book is precisely on how Muslims in particular have been uh, at the receiving end and have lost their uh, access to uh, so many rights uh, because of ghettoization, vigilante mm -hmm. groups, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. These can be looked at as symptomatic of the rise of ethnic democracy, like you say. But is there any way in which the two are also different? Like, are, is India on its way to replicating that model or are there crucial differences that, that we can't yet detect are the signs of the entire authoritarianism project, so as to say? Is there any difference between Israel as an ethnic democracy and India where it's heading towards? Well, there are many differences. There are many mm -hmm. differences um, and similarities at the same time. You know, let, let's begin with the similarities. We have signs of a transition from a de facto to a de jure ethnic democracy with new laws recognizing religion as mm -hmm. an important criterion for citizenship. You know, when, when the uh, CAA, uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, says right. only non-Muslims will right. be eligible to citizenship among the refugees from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, you transform something that was universalistic, right. pluralistic, into a uh, religious base. And that's a way to transform a de facto into a de jure ethnic democracy. But there are differences. There right. are differences uh, also. Um, the authoritarianism you are mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, is is one of them. Uh, in Israel, finally, there's been an alternation in power. Mm -hmm. And all parties join hands for dislodging Netanyahu from prime ministership. We are far from that on the Indian side. And right. uh, the unity of the uh, opposition uh, is not yet there. And therefore, hegemony can continue to benefit uh, BJP uh, for, for, for a longer period. And authoritarianism is also, I think, more pronounced in some senses. Institutions have been undermined. The Indian right. Parliament, the Indian Election Commission, right. uh, the Indian Central Vigilance Commission, the uh, Information Commission, you name one institution and, and, and you see some decline. So this is, of course, 
um, I think, different. Right. Uh, part of these, like these non-state actors that you talk about, right? For example, the BJP IT cell or the social media vigilantism that is going on. How big a role do these actors have played in uh, moving towards that kind of authoritarian state? What is like examples could range between targeted attacks um, to pinning down on people who do not particularly have a certain ascribe to a certain view and um, these kind of people. So what do these intimidation tactics, surveillance and vigilance, how big a role do these play in marking that transition from uh, de facto to authoritarian democracy? A, a very big role in the making of the de facto ethnic democracy because a de facto ethnic democracy claims that the state is not involved. Mm -hmm. The constitution remains right. the same. The law remains the same. But on the ground, right. some people make a difference. So all these campaigns uh, against uh, law of jihad, uh, against uh, conversion, you know, the Garbapsi uh, campaign, uh, against cow slaughter, the cow protection campaign, uh, also the uh, campaign uh, against land jihad, uh, making uh, the space, the public space uh, less pluralistic. All these campaigns have made a huge difference and they were implemented by vigilante groups, including by Trangal, including um, so many others. And they have been a clear reflection of the making of a parallel state, in a way, with organizations policing, disciplining, disciplining society at the grassroots level. And this is something uh, the Song Parivar could do because of its huge network. And that's uh, something that is constantly underestimated. But right. RSS is a unique organization growing right. constantly for almost 100 years now. Right. About the RSS, I had a question that you mentioned how in 2007, uh, for example, it says how it considers politics as dirty work and it publicly disavowed Modi's political style. So where do you think and how Modi reconciles this gap between being a populist leader and the RSS that says that we are wedded to an ideology and not an individual? So where does that gap close between Modi as the supreme leader and as the symbol of the entire Sangh Parivar and the RSS that's, like it says, it's wedded to a more cultural project. How do these two come together? Well, very well. <laughs> they go together very well. The thing is, the um, order has, has changed mm -hmm. for many decades. Uh, BGP leaders, were not micromanaged by RSS, never. BGP had its own autonomy. Before that, Jansong had its own autonomy. And where these parties were responsible for their strategies. Right. Of course, they reported to Nagpur. And uh, uh, at the state level, uh, the chief ministers, the BGP chief ministers, uh, reported to the uh, Prang Prat Sharaks and so on. This changed as early as the uh, 2007 election, when uh, uh, Narendra Modi did not report to the Pran Pratshrak and emancipated himself from RSS. And RSS did not support uh, Modi in the 2007 elections because of what he had done to Bharatiya Kisan Sangh, because of what he had done to uh, Vishwendu Parishad and so on. So since then, for now many years, you see a new order with gradually, very gradually, but very systematically, the BGP leader emancipating himself from RSS and becoming the real leader of the Song Party. And uh, that's a new organizational uh, strategy or architecture, if you want. But does it make any difference on the ground? No, I mean, it not, it's not because the order is different, then the objective does not remain the same. And uh, most of the objectives RSS had on its list have materialized because of Narendra Modi's government, you know, uh, Ayodhya Temple, Article 370, uh, 
uniform civil code to some extent because of the triple talak uh, decision. So there is no divergence. There is just another architecture right. of the uh, Sound Par River. Of course, right. the question is, if you put a pyramid on its head, mm -hmm. it's less stable. Mm -hmm. There is a moment when if the head goes, the pyramid may vacillate. And, and for me, this is the real question. Uh, after Modi, how will the Song Parivar right. restore the previous arrangement right. or adapt the existing arrangement? Right. And what will they do if they have to choose between uh, Amit Shah and Yogi You know, These are the real questions for the future. But the present arrangement works well for, for both. For both. Yeah, on that, uh, there was also another thing that interested me, which was that um, you mentioned how traditional politics and traditional populist leaders would, in time, moderate their political ideology so as to bring more voters in. But that is not the case with Modi because since 2019, the entire agenda has even strengthened further with the Kashmir laws, for example, uh, coming in. So how do you think like uh, Modi stands, like Modi is different? So has RSS ideology changed so as to accept him as the supreme leader or the symbol? Or where do you see this heading? Especially if you're talking about where Sang Parivar will take it from here. How do you see that panning out? How do you see the ideological shift happening within RSS and the Hindutva project? I don't think the shift is within the Hindutva project. The shift is within Indian politics. Okay. We used to think, political scientists used to think that you won election at the center in India. You know, there, there was a centrist trap. Mm -hmm. And that's something... Uh, Vajpayee and Advani had resigned themselves. You know, they wanted to fight elections in a coalition, considering that there was no way you could win on your own, with your own ideology, precisely. And yeah. Narendra Modi introduced something completely different in 2014, saying, no, we don't need allies. We'll win. We'll have the 272 seats uh, we need. So he replaced this centrist trap by a tactic of polarization that had worked so well in 2002 in yeah. Gujarat, but he continued to cultivate. So what he represents, and in that sense, it's a turning point. There'll be mm -hmm. more turning points in the future, but that's a turning point. Yeah. Shifting from a, a, a mainstreamization to a polarization strategy that works for the populist at large in the world yeah. today. We have seen this in the U.S. similarly. You divide society into half and uh, you need to have uh, one of these half behind you for winning. Yeah. So uh, the last question would be, in if you had to describe Modi's India in one line or in the shortest way that you can, how would you do that? Well, you can say that it's a transition mm -hmm. that may be of a huge magnitude, which may be in explained in civilizational terms. Right. A civilization may be dying, the Indic civilization, a civilization that was 500 years old, uh, making diversity the men would say, DNA, right. I mean, uh, the main identity. Right. From this, from this, you you move on towards this majoritarianism, which right. is also based on on traditions with their um, patriarchal dimension. Uh, hierarchies are back in a big way, so it's uh, uh, it's new. It's 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 a mm -hmm. new. It's a new India for sure, but uh, bringing most of its components from uh, a very ancient past and very long-standing right. tradition, right? It, <laughs> as if as if the five hundred years had been uh, a parenthesis. That that makes sense. That's that's very that's a very uh, full 
and a full perspective on your end. Thank you so much, Christoph. That was very, very pleasant. Thank you so much. Thank you.